I think we're ready to start. I'm ready. Ready? Uh, B, you ready? Mm-hmm. Sure you ready? Yeah, bro. All right. Hey, guys, and welcome to the Raw Barbell Club podcast. I'm your host, coach, and all-around good guy, Andy. Today, I'm joined by a new podcast format, which I think is going to be pretty cool. Hopefully, we can do more of them. Uh, I'm joined by Yannick Mifford from Shred Fitness. Yo, yo. Joined by Boo Tran from Snatch Sensei and One RM Media. Yo, what is up? And Philip Liao. Wait, Phil, where's Phil gone? Where is Phil? <laughs> Phil? Phil? Phil should be joining us shortly. He's running late. And we had to we games. <laughs> Weightlifter Phil is too busy signing autographs at the front of the gym. I assume that is what he's doing. Guys, how are you doing today? Uh, well, really well. What have you been doing so far today? Coaching. Um, coaching and eating. Yeah. Boo? Um, I'm super pumped. This is my second podcast for today. So I went to Phil's house this morning and did his podcast. Ooh. So I'm, I'm being a bit of a... Uh, Podcast whore. Yeah. <laughs> is this? Is that? A Wait, new is that format? why Phil's late? No, I was out here that eight. Is this a new format? Four-way podcast after a two-way podcast <laughs> with the same people. Yeah, he's. You know, people get like weirder and weird. Oh, this is. I don't want to bring this up, but generally people get weirder and weirder as they go into porn because they're like, they start going down the rabbit hole of watching something and another thing another thing another thing and then they get weird kinks yeah have you read about how that? did we get into porn from me doing two podcasts well it's just like it it's just going next level next level next level every time oh so kind of like so we're gonna know, get some weird podcast fetish now yeah, yeah it's good you know like when they start with i'll never do that <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're doing it twice in one day so we're gonna be like rubbing <laughs> feet, rubbing feet <laughs> while we podcast or something Oh, I hope not. I uh, all right, uh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, let's get back on topic. Uh, the first thing I wanted to bring everyone's attention to is Yannick. You have a competition this Sunday. This Sunday. I don't know when I'm going to put this out, but if probably this goes after out, the competition. <laughs> probably after the competition. But if this happens before we go live, um, who's competing? Boo, you've got a couple of lifters there. Yeah, I've got the squad coming down. Four lifters. To finish, to finish off the year. It's actually a pretty big comp. Yeah. Two sessions. Um, I think we have like 13 or 14 in each session or something like that. Um, which I suspected because it's sort of one of the last competitions for the year. Um, people are trying to scramble qualification for nationals. Just considering it's um, cut off is pretty early next year. When's the cut off? Feb, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. Oh, wow. Feb, yeah. It's, it's not really? Like yeah, yeah, so you know how End normal, Feb. normally... Yeah, so, um, so not because like normally people um, kind of don't train that hard through the end of December, early Jan. Just about to say that cut your uh, Christmas holiday but short if you now want to they're going to have to really get into their training cycle like right at the start straight away. So well, I actually really like this new format though because what they've done is uh, they've moved the Australian Open uh, later in the year. Yep. And generally, the people that want to try and qualify for the Australian Open are newer lifters. You know, if yeah. you're qualifying for nationals, mm. you've kind of been lifting for a while, mm. so mm-hmm. you should be a member of your state federation, state association the year prior. Yeah, which means that you actually do have time. Yeah. So a lot of us, for example, Yannick, myself, Phil, we would have qualified for nationals at nationals. At nationals, yeah. Yeah. And then Vu, you've qualified for nationals I again. I qualified. Yeah. You gonna join? Yeah. I want to be like you, um, Yannick, and be coach and athlete qualified. Yeah. yeah. At nationals. Two of us. Coach athletes. Yeah, I'm kind of spewing that you were first to do it, though. It <laughs> doesn't sound as special like <laughs> now me being like the second, like, uh, I coach at nationals and I made it as an athlete. Do at I get time. to walk around with a coat that says OG on the back? You, you need a special, like, something on the back of your jacket that signifies that you're the first to do that. Okay, so I think we should have, like, badges. Like, one's an athlete badge and one's a coach badge. Yeah. And I get both. And you get both. And then there should be like a special like ribbon to signify that. Give me a second. What if you are an <laughs> athlete and coach, but you coached yourself? Could you? That's something Ooh. that you could do, Boo. Platinum. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, self-made. <laughs> self-made nationals. Completely self-made. Yeah. Uh, let's get into the nationals qualifiers mm. because that's changed. In the past, we've had, uh, you know, 
international elite, all oh, yeah. of that, all of grading. those numbers, the grading simplified. Yeah, and now we have like a very simplified nationals qualifier. Um, do you guys know what they are? I'll just see if I can bring them up. I also like that. Yeah, they just released the numbers, right? Like yeah. On and a table. Mm -hmm. And the table is really cool. So <coughs> you know you can like check out the competition you want to qualify for. Mm. Slide straight across, and it will tell you what number you need to hit. That's it. Instead um, of having all these grades, just like the grade that you need. The grade you need, no bullshit. Um, for nationals, there's, yeah, no there's like other grades for different. Yeah, so levels. there's essentially no in between grades. You know, like there was grades before for like random shit that mm -hmm. didn't mean anything. So I think that's pretty cool. We're still waiting on like the Oz Open kind of stuff, aren't we? As well. Yeah, so we haven't got qual uh, qualification standards. Yeah, we haven't yes. got qualification standards for the Australian Open mm. or any of the international, uh, like some of the international competitions. Yeah. We do have qualification standards for, uh, is it the Arafura Games? Arafura Games, yeah. yeah. Basically, nationals qualifying. Uh, no, I think they're higher than that, right? What is the Arafura Games? I, I don't know. Do you know what that is? What is it? I haven't heard of this. I so think it's, it's, it's an old comp they used to do a while back. Yeah, that's what I've heard. games, but um, it's open to, I think, all of Asia, or a certain amount of Asia that is quite close to Darwin specifically. Well. Um, and essentially there's multitude of sports, so it's, it's not just um, weightlifting. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. And um, Wait, When is it happening? It's quite, like, March, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's March. It's March fairly early. Um, Whereabouts? Darwin. Oh, well. So, um, pretty There's cool. a couple of things in Darwin this year. Um, There's thanks the, for um, joining us, Phil. Phil has Sorry, I'm late. Phil has caught the crowd out the front. That was <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> and he's here. He just stacked it into his seat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I actually <laughs> might be going to Arafura Games with a couple of listeners of ours. Oh, cool. Um, so I don't know if you guys plan on doing it. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't know what it was. I need. I need more info, but yeah. it sounds interesting. It's it's actually really cool. So um. You know, essentially an international competition. Phil, you can isn't just team take the mic off that. That's pretty cool. But the qualifying is similar to nationals. I think it's the same. So did I qualify? I th I'm pretty sure you did. Woo! Yeah. Let's um, get Darwin. And registration's open for it till later. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll check it out. Darwin, um, what I was just going to say, sorry, um, Darwin's got um, Masters Nationals too, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Is that yeah, Masters so Nationals? Yeah. They're going to have a good year. Hosting mm. stuff. Mm. Well, we should probably talk about the changes to the Masters World Games because that's screwing. Uh, well, not screwing, but like it's messing with a couple of people's plans, right? Can I actually just like confirm something? Phil, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. Hear Say you. hi, Phil. Hey, Andy, where's your beard? Oh yeah, I showed. Oh my god. Yeah. I looked over and I thought, Who, where's Andy? <laughs> Who is this person? Looks like a baby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can I ask a question regarding Masters? Yeah. Is it not true that people had already registered for Masters? Like, wasn't registration open or am I, have I misguided I, I information here? I have no idea what's going on. But so I, from what I understand is that you, once you've qualified, you enter, but whether you actually get to go or not yeah, so is that a was different kind of story. I, I believe that people had already started registering for this and then it was like blown out where they were like, okay, this is going to be huge. Then that's it, they've had to implement this rule. No. So what no, happened? What happened was last year for Barcelona, uh, men's registration was fine. Or it was the Mar yeah. So was, what happened yeah. was last year Barcelona, uh, they had a heap of entries <coughs> and people were really happy to go, and which is cool because masters yeah. lifting is awesome. Also, Barcelona is awesome. Also, Barcelona is awesome, and they had to cut off their entries early, even though they had people like still entering. You. Yannick, you realise that this is a video podcast as well, right? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I was yeah. hoping that like, this is on camera. So, unfortunately, because of that, some people that Where had the camera? entered um, oh, fuck. didn't get to actually go. What? Can you swear, Phil? I can. Am I allowed to swear on the podcast? You, you may. <laughs> you need to check that. You just started off with it. Oh, fuck. So, for those that, for those that missed out... Um, Guys, Philip Liao from M3 is in the building. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here, boys. I'm sorry I'm late. I always am. <laughs> I was kind of on time, based on Asian time. Vu, why are you here so early? Vu was here before I got here. You're retarded. <laughs> um, the last thing I wanted to talk about 
in regards to the qualifications is what 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 do you actually think about them? Because they've changed to accommodate the new weight categories, mm -hmm. but what do you think about how high or low they've gone from Junior, where it was? Can I just like yeah. throw right in here straight yeah. off the bat? Uh, junior World Championships nearly impossible for most lifters. Like we'll be lucky to get a couple there. Yeah, that's pretty insane. Um, I mean, it's meant to be hard, but um, I I feel like surely more juniors will get the better for our sport in the future. Um, yeah, I don't know. That was sort of only something I wanted to point out that I spoke to um, another coach recently about, and uh, it seems like it's you know nearly impossible for quite a few lifters to reach um, that were prospects for it last year. So. Um, that can be kind of hurtful for some lifters if you see that you're very close and then all of a sudden it gets pushed even further away from you. So, um, you know, I don't know if that was the plan to then minimise how many people go, but um, I don't know, that seemed kind of rough to me. <coughs> Maybe. Well, I, haven't, I haven't really looked at the junior. I sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about total. Like, so I don't know yeah. Yeah. what you guys think yeah. about that. I had a look yesterday on for the seniors anyway. Only my way five though, because that's the one I compete in. Uh, it looks like a lot. Fifty five. Uh, uh, sometimes I was look, to be honest, I looked at all three. So oh. Which one's easier here? Did um, you purposely <laughs> look at C grade or? Yeah. Did. <laughs> well, they they that's got rid of the A one. On a good day. <laughs> in a bad day. That was a bad day. A bad day. I'm a bad C grade day. lifter. Oh, um, okay. they're so like C plus on a good day. On a good day, I think like I'd be a B B grade B grade lifter. Uh, on a good day. You're right. We should probably touch on that later. On the, the me being a B grade lifter. L later, later. Not, not now. It's <laughs> too early in the podcast to get into any negativity. No, I think it's positive. <laughs> <laughs> that means that for all you lifters out there, you can still no, be C grade and go to the Commonwealth <laughs> Games. Well, no, actually, I think we should talk about that because I think that that thread was it could have been a, a lot different. So I, I, in, in I was just talking about you being a C grade lifter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later <laughs> on. I, I mean, it, it's, it was a public forum anyway, so I, yeah, yeah. there's no, there's nothing to hide. Um, but in terms of the the lift, the, I mean, they changed the grading from A one A two, and now it's like what A B C D something like that. Simplified. Yeah, yeah, but it's it seems a lot harder. It seems a lot harder, and the way I look at it is, if there is a push to curbing the drugs in this sport, you want to make the last thing you want to do is make it even harder for everyone else to get in because the drugs are used to enhance your performance and now you've made the performance standards even harder so how does that affect the people who are thinking of mm. maybe not i mean i'm is not going to say they're going to is that an issue in australia do you think that do you really think that we need to be worrying too much about that or do you think um well, it depends it depends on the whether that person wants to make the 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 standard right because now it's a lot harder two ways that you i suppose you can view this is if I'm sitting there at the top of the AWF and I say, okay, how do we make our lifters better? Sometimes you push, you, you extend the reach of something and that makes people work that little bit harder or smarter or for or some people cheat. Yes. Absolutely. But then if you look at where the standards were before, they were lower, like from base, yeah. I don't know, well, well based I off the, all also, the weight class. I think that comes from, if you look at it, for most people, the way the weight classes have changed, it has forced people to go up in weight, not down. So I think that's where most of it stems from. Yeah, I think so f um, from a different standpoint too, I guess, because you're looking at more around your weight class. Um, if we looked at last year around the 85 kilo weight class, which is now the 89, around that weight class, we actually had too many lifters um, make the qualifying. Like we, we had like two full sessions of 85s, right? Um, and the, the B, the B or the second session um, was full of people who were just like fringe, like just made it mm. kind of thing. So for, for that weight class, uh, which is where I look at, which makes sense, um, the increase in the standard actually helps the numbers there quality wise. Do you think that's equally reflected within the amount of weight they give you though? So that four kilo increase in body weight, is that proportional to how much they've increased the standard by? Uh, well, based off my own individual sample, um, being able to go up in body weight, it did help me Where'd lift you find more uh, strength-wise, and so I made the new qualifying standard. So, but 
for those that are still trying, then that obviously will be hard, harder, for sure. Yeah. I don't know that. Yeah. How did did nationals get harder? I don't think nationals got harder, did it? Nationals didn't no, get harder. International got yeah, harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think no, um, nat- nationals went up a little bit. Did it? Yeah. Okay. So in I line with like a slight increase like in weight. Even, body weight. even then, like, what's the problem with more people going to nationals anyway? What's what's the why would you want to? If you want the, or this is, I don't, I don't go to sport, right? I'm, it's just, this is just an opinion. But the more people you have that have the, if it's, if it's within reach, you keep people within the sport, like you said, yeah, with I've, the junior I've world said championship. That I've said that before, yeah. So, um, when we're talking, okay, why do people lift? To compete, to push themselves. Well, not everyone lifts not everyone to compete. Not everyone wants to compete. No, yeah. but majority of people do weightlifting to get involved in the sport to a certain degree. Mm. Okay, so like majority. And if you're the AWF, that's really all you give a shit about, really. We don't care about people who want to lift in their gym and never compete because well, they're not doing anything for anyone, really. Um, like you said, Phil, if more people can see that they can achieve nationals qualification, um, you're potentially bringing more people to the sport. But I think uh, also the Australian Open kind of serves as a nice, yeah. like... That's a, a good platform level. for that. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. It feels like nationals, um, but it's much easier to get into. So mm. they do have, I guess, like that lower entry point. Yeah. And so it's like, well, you can't have like nationals be as easy. Yeah. There's got to be a separation in terms yeah. of like the, the level, I guess. Oh yeah, that you're, you're reaching for. Yeah, I I agree with that. But um, yeah, I definitely think that there should be more rather than less because, well, I mean, let's not like having more lifters. More lifters build yeah. the sport. Like, let's sure. not let's not beat around the bush here. More people competing equals more money for the sport. Uh, but that's what people do sport for, to enjoy the, uh, I guess, the, the participation of something. And then, you know, how many li- lifters do you know that are just looking forward to traveling for something to do with the sport? It just makes you feel a little bit of a sense of achievement and, um, uh, I'm not going to say holiday, but uh, how to explain this? You know, you're doing something, you're traveling for something, mm-hmm. a, a sense of participation, and, and that's what people do sport for. You don't do sport, um, especially at this level and at this age, unless you're, um, you know, to necessarily become a professional, because that's especially the space of weightlifting, you're, unless you're uh, six, you know, 16 or less, you're probably past that point of, you know, making dollars off the sport. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think just to, to come back to the Australian Open, um, from what I've heard down the grapevine is that there's a potential for them to expand on the Australian Open okay, and potentially make it a series or uh, make it like just a bigger event, a more inclusive event as well. Yeah. Okay. Which would, which would be pretty cool, right? Because I know in well, America, America, yeah, they've yeah. got the mm. American, Open, American Open, but yeah. as a series, right? So four part series, isn't it? So yeah, you I qualify for the, the, the initial series and then you have to go through stages to make the actual like mm. nationals nationals could that work like that? for australia where we don't have like well that was more lifters. as a result yeah um but we don't have as many so maybe it's not going to be nationals. maybe it's not going to be like a series mm. but if they're putting their eggs in that australian open basket that's going to help drive more people you know towards the sport would be cool to turn um the australian open into like a national club it is a national club competition. No, but like a little more emphasis on like a club winning the Australian Open. But I, I'm pretty sure points. that's how it works. Like the, like I think Cougars wins most years, and you represent your club. You don't represent your state at all. Yeah, yeah, th- I know that. Yeah, I understand that you represent the <coughs> club. But um, I mean, I'm talking a little more uh, emphasis on it. Like, so it being a big thing, like you know, promoting it and um, advertising it as a club competition, like a team competition, you know. Like uh, win your club something kind of thing, a little bit more drive towards that, because I think that would also drive more um, clubs to get out there and want to get people to the Australian Open. Yeah, no, no, and, that's, uh, that's make it worthy, you know. Maybe have a first, second, third, and um, you know, really establish who could be potentially the best club in Australia. Cougars. Yeah. <laughs> now look, Miles and Angela do a brilliant job with their club, Cougars, and there's a reason that they are very popular and you know, obviously have such high results, it's because of the work that is done in that club, so kudos to those two. Um, actually, speaking of Miles and Angela, we should talk about the new AWF board. Yeah. 
So, uh, did you know that there was a new AWF board built? Uh, I knew there was a new CEO. Yeah, so Mike Keelan is no longer the CEO of the AWF. Ian Moyer is the new CEO. Funny enough, Ian Moyer was kind of like my first coach. Oh, wow. Well. Not wow. without him knowing it. I'm pretty sure he wrote my first program. Because uh, if, you go on, that? if you go onto the Queensland weightlifting website, they've got a couple of free sample programs. Uh, and that was the f first uh, Olympic weightlifting program I ever followed. Mm. So, yeah. Um, he's been in the sport for a long time. He's definitely capable. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Mike Keelan for all the, all the work he's done over the last few years. He's been an awesome CEO from, from what I've seen. I haven't seen anything... Uh, crazy happen and so in my congratulations on becoming the new CEO and our new board is uh yeah guys keep making keep making noise while I <laughs> while I look for this thing I literally I just had it what does it matter happens now? kind of matters. Why? Well, I mean, the direction Are of the sport be is, like, pretty well um, aligned to the people that run it, right? Yeah, so what, I guess, like, what's, what's to lose? What's well, I mean, change? we won't know what to do oh, until they oh, start okay. making it. So we don't know whether it's planning to change, until, right? Until no, I mean, we don't really know. But I, 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 have seen that. I do like the list of Unless, the, unless the previous board was shit and no one liked where the direction was, then now there's a new board. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> but I, I think But I have no opinion. I don't know who's gonna be like people like complaining anyway. I think it's a tough spot to be in if you are on the board. Yeah, well, people are always gonna win. Yeah, pretty much. When you're at the top, no one not everyone appreciates your decisions and you can't please everyone. Yeah. I mean Facebook a Andy's on the New South Wales board and it's like rubbish, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm rubbish. <laughs> you so are. it's gotta be something to do with his involvement. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're a little bit concerned of the state of New South Wales weightlifting, you reckon you should direct all of your hate to Andy. <laughs> yeah. Andy, make some changes, Crush mate. That guy. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> Alright, I found I found the board. So Angela Wydal has been appointed as the director of the AWF. Oh well, yeah. congrats, Angela. Uh, Sam Coffer is the president. Deborah Ackerson, who has also been on the podcast before, yep. well. is on the board. Lynn Jones is on the board. Oh, that's Phil cool. Maunder and Charles Quagliata. Oh, Charles is from New South Wales, so we have a New South Wales person on the board. Yeah. Uh, that's Charlie, right? Really? I think so. I'm, I'm not sure about his last name. Ah. I just know him as Charlie. Uh, then we've got Pedro San <coughs> Sanchez as well. Also, I, I love Lynn Jones, by the way. Do you? Yeah, absolutely amazing. <laughs> have you heard him talk about his... Actually, I should get him on the podcast, but have you heard him talk about his uh, first ever gold medal female lifter? I got Tara Knott? No, but I can I imagine because he's like super passionate. So I can just imagine yeah. how passionate that story would be. If you ever meet him, you should ask him about coaching Tara Knott because I think that's a highlight of his mm. his career and life. Awesome. Uh, I want to get into some actual help for people that are listening. Mm. Lifters that listen, coaches that listen, and all of the people in between. Yeah, well, let's do it. Yeah. Go for it. What, yeah, are so gonna, what are we going to talk about? Well, the, the first thing I want to talk about is just coaching the jerk. Like right. coaching the jerk? Like jerks? Like, the, like jerk coaching heads. the jerk? <laughs> or being a jerk as you coach? <laughs> but we could talk about all three. <laughs> but the first one I wanted to talk about was like, how do you guys teach the jerk from like to a, to a brand new beginner? Oh, so this is, I'll probably just go to this today. What I do is I take a video of myself <laughs> And put it up and say, whatever the fuck you do, don't do that. <laughs> and usually they become good at jerking. <laughs> that's, that's fair. You lead by example. <laughs> that's exactly yeah, what so you do. But don't do what I do, and you'll be just fine. But I think you've got a great jerk, Yannick, in training. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to become roast, roast central. <laughs> Roast the nature of the central. Did you like purposely like yourself? Like, no, I did. Talk about the jerk, Yannick. Yeah, Andy really thought about that. He started off with the jerk while well, Yannick is here. No, I definitely, I definitely <laughs> like didn't. You couldn't talk about the snatch. I do. <laughs> I, so the reason I want to talk about jerks is I think they're not talked about enough. No. I think we, you know, we've got all these. Well, we've got all these like 
weird people that go around being like snap senseis and <laughs> whatever, but no one has ever a jerk sensei. <laughs> I should I could be that now. After my last performance. Oh that yeah, that was <laughs> Sensei. I made it, didn't I? You clean, did. it, clean it, joke, Sensei. Wait, if you saw my face when that happened, like, I wish that was on camera. It was just like... And then there was a moment of, like, I guess we'll call it realisation, where I was like, why the fuck can't I do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was amazing. Um, no, that's a good point. I actually think we should talk about the jerk. Um, and I'm pretty interested to hear Phil's take on it, because I know uh, I'm always interested to hear what you think about teaching beginners uh-huh. and uh, teaching movement uh-huh. so how about you start us off and like it's not about cold showers I promise oh by the way if you want to check out cold showers pop on my Instagram page anyway um, uh, like, well I personally think that the, the split jerk is the hardest movement inside weightlifting like, and my justification is pretty there's, there's like three planes that you're work, working in you've got the, the vertical up and down you've got Cross, and you've also got rotation in it as well to worry about. <coughs> sorry, sorry, were you laughing? I was just coughing. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to go. <coughs> no, 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 I was just coughing. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you've got three, like you've got all three planes. Just hold the mic up to your oh, face. Sorry. Yeah. You've got all three planes to worry about. Not to mention, it's by far the heaviest load, and it's just, oh, sorry, and the and and the most explosive one within the weightlifting movement. In terms of coaching it, um, to a beginner, I think it's really important that you're able to at least show them what it looks like first and then you have to actually break down the principle behind the split jerk now this may be different between the four of us but i teach the split jerk as a controlled descent and ascent i don't really teach an explosive ascent as much as i because i think the important part is that you complete the movement as opposed to do it quickly Mm. and then punching yourself under quickly i know some some coaches teach that when you (coughs) drive the bar you should be pushing off with your shoulders like a push press as well. I don't like that. I don't think that's how the split jerk is done. And that's kind of how I was taught in China as well. So um, I teach, I show it first to the beginner. I explain the basics of what's happening in terms of up, down. What and and what are the basics? Um, you want to drive the bar up with your legs while keeping your torso as rigid as you can. And then from there, you keep your torso as straight as you can, drop the hips under, and use your arms to push yourself under. But I mean, I explain it like this, but when I do it with a beginner, it's really one thing at a time. First thing is drive up, and then come down, and the next part I'll add the arms, the next part I'll add the split, and I'll break it down like, systematically like that. So what you're saying is, you start with essentially just like a jerk drive, yes, or like a jerk dip, yes. but slow, yes. or controlled at least, mm-hmm. and from there, you'd start adding the arms and then you'd add would you ever teach like a, a power jerk or push jerk before you teach a split jerk just to teach them because uh, obviously the split jerk like you said is yeah. a little bit you know uh, more technical yeah I actually go through the no feet power jerk first okay I go no feet power jerk then I go power jerk and then I'll go split afterwards I, I like that concept yeah. of the no feet power jerk because I think it really trains you the timing and the up up and under yeah so is that because sometimes people move their feet in a, a power jerk, yeah, um, but they don't actually extend. They kind of like go up and just lift their feet to, to, to the move the feet. Yeah, the starfish. Yeah, yeah. And will you, jump. will you let them in the no feet come up onto their <coughs> toes? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I um yeah I teach similar format. So always teach the power jerk first. Um, before actually split jerk, we're teaching the split jerk. I actually get them to do a. Uh, strict press in a split jerk position with the feet so what i'm doing there is just um getting them familiarized with where the receiving position is the bar path um, but more importantly uh stability under the bar before they start moving in a dynamic dynamic fashion into that position so you are drilling their catch position yes i see and do you guys have a preference for like where the catch is like do you have a like a this is where it has to be this is how your legs should look or do you just eyeball it that for me becomes very dependent on their body shape and I'm looking for something that looks natural to the person yeah I agree like yeah it's I think it's a bit of both like having a, a kind of idea of what you want mm. it to look like 
um, but then also for it to look you know, right for that person That's when right. they do it. Like, like I would never want to look see strong or comfortable. I would never want to see Zoo with like a straight leg jerk, like back leg. You know, you know, but some people will pull that off really well, and that's just probably the only way they're going to be able to do it. But I think they need to assess what looks natural and what is becoming stronger for the lifter. Fair enough, Phil. I go through. I go through more principles, like what, what are the things that need to be achieved predominantly for m- most people before. I adjust anything. So the first thing for me in a split jerk is where the hips are. So are they directly under the the rib cage? If that's if that's there, then where the feet are not important yet. And then I look at where the rib cage is. Uh, I think I think you and Kush are really good at this, which is um, whether your rib cage is stacked actually on top of your pelvis. If that's there, then that's good. But then there are people who don't have end range shoulder flexion. There are people who don't have end range shoulder flexion and they can't actually stack their rib cage on top of their pelvis to en- get full shoulder, their shoulders all the way back. Shout out to Kush. Best fit, great physio, by the way. Best physio <laughs> ever since. Anyway. Um, it's a shame she's not here anymore. I, 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 I saw her for like a week, two weeks, and then she just said, I gotta go. And I went, well, fuck. Good treatment there. Um, yeah, so then if those things are good, because Essentially, we, with a split jerk, you have to hold that shit. And there's no point landing in a good position if you can't hold it. Um, rib cage, pelvis, and then rib cage, pelvis, and then where the feet are. I look at the alignment of the knee in relation to the to the foot, and I, th- I think the angle that they told us is it's supposed to be vertical. Yeah, or slightly past or vertical. S- yeah, there's a bit of room there. Yeah, yeah. It's like good. Yeah, but if that vertical makes something else along the pelvis or it's or, or the rib cage or something fucks up there then you have to look at the bigger picture yeah. exactly yeah. exactly not but just one thing exactly yeah. yeah and i think the bigger picture is actually where your torso and your pelvis is as opposed to where maybe your feet are because yeah because i mean that's that's what's gonna hold the, the most load like the best in terms yeah. of being able to catch it yeah like yeah yeah and some people will rotate more when they go too wide or some people you know and it's that's where the individuality comes into it but I look for those main things first before I make any adjustments I think something uh, a couple of beginner coaches that I've seen uh, I guess leave out it's it's really simple to say look the back leg needs to be 45 degrees the front leg needs to be perpendicular to the you know the floor and the hips are underneath the shoulders the shoulders are underneath bar that's like a, a really good fundamental but then like you said it is really important to see how the rib cage is behaving in reference to the shoulders the shoulder girdle as well as reference to the elbows and in reference to the bar and then how the hips are behaving as well because if you have any sort of weird uh, talky things happening where the hips are actually rotating or the the rib cage is twisted the shoulders are twisted those are things that you can't see very well from the side sometimes mm. so I, I know Zu does this a little bit in the jerk like you twist a little bit mm-hmm. yeah something that you're working on obviously mm. um, and I know I, I do a little bit of twist it like from the <coughs> hips like I'd like to point out that I wouldn't even just say beginner coaches I've seen like coaches that have been around for years that will not move away from the certain key points that they're looking for it doesn't matter who they're coaching um, so I think that's also an important thing to point out. Um, to go into that a little further le- with the point of like these little things that happen um, that aren't ideal in movement, uh, sometimes it's not a case of cueing the athlete mm. for their movement. Like from, from me um, in this example, a lot of it stems from like my right shoulder's a bit doggy at the moment, my right hip is tight, so I'm naturally gonna lean and tilt towards compensation and I need to address those things like just like from like a prehab or strength standpoint yeah and it's not just going to happen like with the heaviest weight um, by cueing my movement cues aren't like everything in coaching I think there's too many coaches that aren't looking for weaknesses and addressing them you know I can say to certain people all I want hips straight or hips under the bar but if there is an actual weakness that is stopping them from doing that it's just like banging your head against a wall. Like you can keep telling them all you want, but if it's not working, it's not working. 
you know, um, it's the same issue with my Joe. Um, people can tell me all they want, lock my elbows out. Like, I'm not <laughs> sitting there fucking going, you know what? I am not going to lock my elbows out today. Like, it, it's, that's not because what... Can like, you like, snatch you lock out, so... Yeah, yeah it's, it's, like, it's, like, You know like how to I'm, lock out something. <laughs> it's not like I'm trying to not lock out. Um, and the best part is, like, you're going to get all these coaches come up to you and, oh, you need to try this and you need to try that. But they, they've seen me on, like, a platform. They haven't seen my training or what else is involved or... Um, you know all the important stuff, right? So you know I'm like actually like quite sick of being told that. Come on, um, Phil, give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, no, no, this like is I wasn't going to rip into you. <coughs> like it's, understanding, <laughs> it's understanding weaknesses and how the body works. I think there's too many coaches out there that aren't <coughs> delving or diving into those areas. It's like this is the cue, and if you're not doing it, then you're not doing the cue properly. That, that's bullshit. Like there's stuff that you need to be addressing first before trying to fix the cue, or while you're trying to fix the cue. Yeah. yeah so w- what you're basically telling me is. It's not just about cueing, it's about exercise prescription mm. and, you know, working on muscular imbalances as well. Yeah, yeah. well, I'd really like to say that, like, strength is a real big thing. Um, you know, there is a lot of weightlifters out there lifting loads that they're not strong enough for. Um, but, you know, like, understanding movement as a coach. Like, we've gone past the days where, like, you just, like, give someone a brutal program, jab some steroids in, and, and they're going to be sick lifters. But that still works, right? Um, <laughs> well, that works <laughs> yeah. well. But um, yeah, like you know, for example, I use mine as a perfect example. I'm, well, sick, to death. <laughs> I'm sick to death of being told that I need to do more jerk dives to get better at my jerk. I don't know if you've seen my jerk. I send the freaking thing into orbit. It's got nothing to do with how high I can drive the bar. What's a jerk um, dive? Sorry, like we have jerk, different terms for different. Like a jerk dip. A jerk dip. Yeah, okay, the amount so. of people that told me I need to do more jerk dips to get better at jerks. That's not your jerk dip. Yeah, I know that. Sherlock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You just need to straighten your elbow, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> how, high, how high could it be? I know that you can <laughs> you just up. do this. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess the point is, like, <laughs> you if might. you don't know, like, learn. And if you uh, have a coach that doesn't know, find one that does, because that's when you're going to start making some important um, advancements. Con- in yeah, context is important. Like, it's... Yeah. A- as much as I like to... Because we're, we're coaches here, and like you see, like lifters in comps, mm. in comps, and you always like have that coach's eye switched on, and you just like have this assumption that oh, you know, like this mm. thing that I use for like all these people will work for this guy, yeah. but like I have no context, so you have to like always like yeah. r- remember that as well. And so. you also have to take into account the low hanging fruit. So that might just not be the one thing that that coach of that athlete is dealing with at that moment. Mm. Yeah, you know, they might have a whole host of problems that That's they've right. gone. Yeah addressed first address that they're addressing first so like i would never beat up <coughs> a coach for not uh you know mm. making their athlete do a certain thing in, in in whatever like like you said Vu, it's all about context yeah. and then you know to further like the point of you and your elbows and your lifting and vu was mentioning that your snatch is great but like that video you put up of your you know 70 kilo snatch for the first time back in the day in crossfit yeah, oh, like that was bent as hell. Yeah, so mm. like, look at how much improvement there is in his overhead position. Well, it's look at my. Uh, well, there's still a problem. Look at my jerks from three years ago. Like, I was lucky to be able to do any form of jerk that would pass in any competition. Yeah. Um. And you know, everyone like you know, everyone has something to say. That's fine. I don't really care. Um, I've got pretty thick skin, but um. What annoys me is that people assume I'm not working on it. And I think that's what coaches or other people, especially when you're looking at an athlete, just don't assume that they're out there lifting and they haven't been working on it. You know, like, I've worked my, like you would know, you know of all people that I have, like, worked my ass off to fix this joke because it is literally the, the kind of difference for me in beca- becoming a certain level of a weightlifter. Um, so when people assume that I'm not doing things to fix it, it gets a little bit frustrating. Um, and then they assume that their technique is going to be better. Dude, haters are going to hate, right? Mm. Mm. So I want to say two things. The first one's serious. The second one's a joke. Yeah. Um, Start with a joke. How many times do you hear dumb shit and dumb obvious shit being said by coaches? Like, I th- and we do this all the time. Like, when yeah. somebody catches a clean, a clean, we go, stand, stand up! <laughs> like, what the fuck do you think this guy's trying to do? <laughs> They're not hanging up, bro. What They're the not fuck? Like, and, then, and you know, shit like... Stay um, tight. <laughs> stay tight. Like, oh, well, no shit. Drive it overhead. Whoa. 
I'm like, I, I know. Yeah. Like, we, we all know this. Punch Every up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, lock out your elbows. Mm. Mm. Like, hold it, it. it. Hold it, yeah. <laughs> like, but we all are guilty of this. And it, uh, for 100%. me, when, I, like, when I'm at a comp and I listen, I don't, like, these coaches, we, um, we all take the piss out of each other, of right? Course, yeah. But we say a lot of dumb shit to our lifters. Of course. Like, when you, before you go see, a, before a lifter goes out, you pull them by the shirt and you go, don't forget, keep the bar close. And you're like, oh, didn't think I was going to keep the bar close. Hey, I did that to Boo the other day. Like, what, what do you want this kind of... Oh, sorry. That's a bad <laughs> Don't say that word. <laughs> what do <are> you... <laughs> what do you want this guy to be thinking when he's lifting? The lift is over in like half a second. Does he... Does, if he the moment he thinks keep it close after when it's off the floor, it's gone. Yeah. Don't tell someone how important it is either. He knows it's important. It's a competition. Like, why do we say <laughs> such obvious shit to people and just fuck with their head? Like, just let them go out there and lift. It's that simple. That's a joke. Anyway, um, the other one. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit of a. No, man. but I think um, <laughs> in saying that, like, um, if you're new to lifting and in competition, you do need a little bit of uh, guidance, I guess. Yeah. Even though it's simple. Well, stuff. There's the simple stuff, and then there's obvious stuff, like stand up from the clean. How how many times have you ever seen somebody clean it, catch it, and go and not stand up? Yeah, but is that like almost is like, that like me that, every is that time? An obvious, <laughs> is that an obvious cue, or is that like? Their version of motivating someone. Just like oh no, I get, I get that. Oh, I, I get up. that as well. Like there's, yeah. there's elements of screaming at people. There's evidence for this. When you scream at someone, well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a coach just saying to someone, uh, you missed your snatch because you left it in front. Well, like <laughs> they know. Yeah. But what <laughs> didn't they do yeah. that resulted well, in them yeah, leaving the bar? Don't get me wrong. Um, this is not about the motivational aspect of screaming at someone. Yeah, this yeah. is just the comical aspect of yeah, like yeah. the stuff we say. Yeah, yeah. I, I've said this as well. Right? I've said to people, so stand up. Huh? What's the serious part? Oh, the serious part was actually about the cueing. Okay. Now, um, I what you say to me, despite what you intend, you want me to do, can be interpreted in a completely different way in my yeah. head. Right? It's like you speak English, I understand Chinese, mm -hmm. and it and um, as coaches, sometimes um, you may say something that works for one person, yeah, despite wanting the same outcome, and that will not work for another mm -hmm. person because in their minds, yeah. um, it work, uh, one same of the common thing. things, right, is more pull. What does that mean? Don't don't say anything. What does that mean to you? More pull. For me, if someone said more pull, I'm literally just like thinking I need to pull it higher. Which which means what? More 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 elbow. Yeah. More hip for me, that would be more elbow. Okay. What well, well, more pull mean for you? More pull would mean uh, for me um, at the hip, like a more effort in extending. What would it mean for you? Yeah. So for me, it'd be just to like think about pulling it higher. Which predominantly through the arms, maybe. Uh, just yeah, finishing harder and yeah. maybe a combination of what these two said. Yeah, and for me, more more pull. Uh, I don't like that word for myself because I start cranking my arm and I forget my legs. So I like to think about it as more drive, more push. And so like all, all four of us just had something different mm. for more yeah, pull. Definitely. Right. <coughs> I yeah, definitely. I think definitely. Um, yeah, each one of us has an understanding of like an outcome that comes to like the same kind of place when we look at lifting, but mm. um, we might describe it differently at yeah. any given point mm. but even though we describe it differently we all kind of can see um the same like picture that we're trying to paint as well yeah. exactly exactly and, and that's my point just to lead on to what phil was talking about a really cool thing that you can do as a as a coach is ask your athlete what do you think I said? Mm. Or, or does that uh, even make sense yeah, to you like, at all? Does that mm. make sense? Like, you'll hear me say that all the time, not just to athletes, to everyone. It's like, does that make sense? And, you know, like, I get them to relay their idea of what they need to do. And then you can be like, actually... I didn't mean that. Yeah, I yeah. didn't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. What would get you to do this exact outcome? And then yeah, because like sometimes people just don't want to look stupid, and they'll just say, "Yep, yep, I got, I got that cue." Or mm -hmm. like they'll just agree with you, and then like they won't, they won't get do it. what you're saying. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, you know, five day, like five times later, you're like, "Do you actually understand what I'm saying?" Mm. And they're like, "No, sorry." And, and then, then that's how you like, run. Oh, that's, that's how you. That's my fault. Not it's not yours. Like just tell me. Yeah. Hundred percent, and it, it, that is on you. That is on the coach. But, um, and that's how you end up with this weird scenario where. Sometimes you tell your athlete something like 20 times mm. and then another coach that they meet for somewhere else mm. will say like something pretty once, much the same yeah. but once yeah. and then they get it just because they're speaking their language, right? And then you yeah. just like hit your head on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, why didn't I think like, I told that? you that. <laughs> yeah. 
but it's also this is what I learned in China. It's sometimes you know words are confusing. Just mm. push them. Just poke them. Just make them do the outcome you want. You can't misunderstand that. You're just literally giving them the sense that you want them to feel. There's no misinterpretation within words for that. You're just yep. feeling something. Cool. Um, is there any one that teaches like strip presses or push presses <coughs> prior to teaching the jet? Yeah, I think or, or just a, a, as a general kind of uh, principle of like building base strength mm -hmm. for anyone that doesn't have um, a training age, I guess, or like strength yeah. training. The I movement pattern for me, so I even do it in the snatch. I teach a um, snatch press before they actually do a snatch. Same thing with the jerk. They would do some pressing. Like I said, the strip press might be in a split jerk position. Uh, teach the movement pattern first, then start to do it with dynamics. Um, the same thing, similar to what Phil said, I teach people to lift slow first. Um, you actually hear me in training all the time, slower, slower, slower. But then you go to another gym and you might hear people, faster, faster, faster. I don't want to see anyone lifting fast unless they completely have like a decent control of their technique first. Um, I, I can't even remember who it was. I had did see another, uh, actually it might have been uh, Greg Everett, who put up a post about um, there is no point in even applying speed if you can't get the mechanics right doing it slow. Um, so that's what I try to enforce. Slow first, then we can work on the speed. Because the speed will come. <coughs> the speed will come as you get better. But what you do have is if you've got these, especially when you look at a, a new weightlifter that doesn't understand weightlifting yet, you see this thing that's really fast and it's like, whoa, that's so fast. So then you try and say, okay, now let's do it. And then all of a sudden, they have zero control of where the bar is. They can't meet their hips. They can't time the, the pull properly. And it's all because they're trying to just rip this bar off the floor because they don't understand where the speed's coming from. They don't mm -hmm. understand that the pull should be controlled and the speed is actually pulling yourself under the bar fast. They just see this fast thing and they, they try to end, like copy that. And um, I think that's really important. That's the main thing I try to um, teach first. Pattern first, then apply speed. Mm -hmm. Well, I just to tag on to that, I mean, like I just did a video recently, right, with um, people who say they can't like do their technique well until there's like weights on the bar mm. and not being able to display like the control in their technique. Did you smack them? No, I didn't smack them, but I just <laughs> <laughs> um, like yeah, like of you smacking them? <laughs> no. <laughs> just like being able to show like good snatch technique with the bar, empty yeah. bar, straight up. Like it doesn't need to be fast, yeah. it just needs to be like sound. Well, the amount of like I'm gonna say CrossFit athletes because they are like usually a pretty big culprit of this. The amount of CrossFit athletes that have fixed their snatch or clean technique by simply forcing them to go slow off the floor is ridiculous. And I get where it stems from. Um, obviously, trying to do things fast and everything fast. But yeah, just slowing that down. And that I guess like the point where you're about to go to. I know where Noah's heading. Um, Sorry, feel free. No, that's that's yeah, pretty much it. Like yeah. the heavier load forces you to go slower. All of a sudden, your technique gets better. Um, but then if you can like force them to go slower on the lighter weights and apply the around the right amount of speed and the right amount of pull to the lighter weights, when they get to the heavy weights, they're not gonna go, oh shit, this is moving slow and it's heavy because they are a little bit more accustomed to the bar moving at that speed. So then we kind of then adjust the speed as the weight gets heavier or the tempo even. Cool. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a question for you. This is, referring to the literature that we have in terms of power and technique. Mm. Um, most of the literature we have in sports science and, and uh, yeah, most, most sports science is the, the faster you move, the your, your technique starts to break down. I think we all can agree on that. Yes. And the second thing is on the force velocity curve mm. of power, your power production is best at 50 to 60% yes. of one RM, I yep. believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you have, so you have, you have this thing that says your speed will Moving faster makes you worse in your technique. Yes. And the heavier you go, the slower you become. Yes. So our sport is about moving quickly yep. and moving heavy. Mm. Do you think this means we should not maybe not m try and move as quickly in the... No, sorry. Does this mean we have to train our absolute strength to the point where the weights we're trying to move become about 50 to 60% of what we can actually do? I'll tell you my philosophy straight off the bat if that's really good. I want to teach the bar to move slow, but the body to move fast. 
What? <laughs> Please explain. <laughs> well, we're not just ripping the bar as fast as possible, but we are m- getting the bar to a certain point, and then we are moving our body around it faster. So think about a snatch. The snatch is always going to go to a certain point. It's us that is getting under the bar. Yeah, I feel you. So as ah, the load gets yeah. heavier, yeah. you need to move faster. You don't need the bar to move faster. You need to move faster. You have to. You had to explain that. Yeah, it's so much better. Than <laughs> you first yeah. Except I'll challenge you on that one because all of the research that, that that exists, and I think you know what a great person to ask would be Lester Hope. The max acceleration happens at like the peak of the movement. There needs to be. Um, in the highest level of weightlifting, the max power is produced at the top. Yep, that makes sense because that's where you're then initiating power. Yeah, yeah, but then the, that wouldn't that mean the bar is moving quickest at that point as well? Is it, or are you just applying force to the bar? No, be, because that's acceleration is at its highest. So if it's yeah. acce- measured acceleration, the bar is moving at its quickest at that point. That's also right at the part where you're then initiating your movement around the bar, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, but but then I mean. My, my line of thinking now is... I, think I, I, I get I what you're think saying. What, I think you're, what I'm you're trying to get, get at yeah. is more... The tempo becomes important. Okay, so the bar needs to move faster at a certain point. But if you're if you are trying to rip it off the floor as fast as possible, you are going to lose that momentum and tempo where it should be, which is at the top. So going to revise your philosophy then? Just... just so you got to you move... Better, you, yeah. you, well, what you're saying is... You got to be controlled to a certain point, and then at the last point, you got to move as quick as you can That's right. to drop under. Yeah, and I think okay. a big part Timing, of it, yeah. yeah, is your tempo and understanding where to apply that force or speed. I think a better word for that, rather than tempo, would be like your rhythm, because yeah, yeah, the tempo yeah. changes, but the rhythm is actually the peak and flow of mm. the movement. So as long as, and you can tell, like when someone has good rhythm, even if their technique's not perfect yet, like you know that it's going to yeah. get there. Yeah, someone who does move like that, like yeah. Brando, Brando Wakeland, like you could see when he started that he had that rhythm down, but he just didn't have the, the you know, the A to B yet. Mm. And now that he's sort of like, you can see it really coming through. I'd probably bit. argue that he had the power, but he didn't have the rhythm yet because he didn't quite know when to apply that, that speed and power. The whole thing was just too quick until he was able to slow it down at a certain point and control the bar mm. more. I'd love to talk to him again and uh, and see what he's been what, like what he thinks because he's he's a pretty cognizant guy like yeah. he he'd probably be able he'd probably be up for joining us one week mm. maybe we'll put him on Skype or something. <laughs> yeah. But um, do you kind of get what I mean though? Like I do, I do, I I completely understand what you mean. Mm. Um, but I think now we're sort of de- debating in a circle. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. if we go back to uh, just what you were saying originally about absolute strength. And making it super light, I think that's very much how a lot of the really elite weightlifters train. Like if you see people like Martin, Tian Tiao, all of even like Tashiki, all of those guys have massive squats. Yeah. You know, compared to what they're snatching and clean and jerking. So what they're snatching and clean and jerking is very minute in, you know, in uh, relation to what they're lifting in competition, right? So mm. is that is that kind of where you were going with that? Yeah. Kind of so thought? if you want to improve your technique, and you want to improve your like how, how quickly you move, you just got to keep. You got to get your absolute strength to a level yeah. that that becomes perhaps the fifty to sixty percent. Oh the yeah, I yeah. definitely I agree with that. Um, I think you can see mo- with most of, well, I think anyway with most of my athletes that applies, um, for I think kind of comes through in my coaching that my main focus. Hold the mic. My main focus is the strength, like the absolute strength, get them strong while refining that technique. Um, I don't necessarily need to see them s- like snatching that highest percent, but I want to see their leg strength and their press strength and all that stuff go. I want to see that go up. Um, and then as they're getting better as weightlifters, you can then start to catch that up because it can come, once you're getting stronger, those movements can catch up a lot easier. All right, so I want to finish this jerk topic off. Um, can we leave the people at home with one, just some basic <coughs> fundamentals that they should look for in their own jerks or if they're a coach in their uh, athlete's jerks? And then two, just give people some exercises or things that they can work on to improve their jerk. Let's say we talked a lot about uh, like a lack of lockout today. So maybe we'll just talk about 
uh, some exercises that they can do and I know it's individual but just some exercises that they can put into their program or their athletes programs to help them uh, achieve a stronger lockout take it away Yannick you're the expert at the jerks yeah um, <laughs> Phil you're so savage <laughs> for me it was uh, I feel like you deserved what happened to you yesterday <laughs> <laughs> I probably did um, uh, for me it was pulling or backing away from um, pull ups and bicep work that was a big problem for me and, and why is that is that just because of the internal rotation and the, uh, you know the, I guess like overhead so no it, it, my you know, having my lats and serratus pulling down on me while I'm trying to reach up yes yeah. is, is a big problem for me I know where it stems from like I, I could t- tell you straight away yeah. and is that just because it's pulling you into extension or is it because it's also pulling you into internal rotation no well that's I actually when I go for a jerk I struggle to get into any sort of like I would like to be able to receive with more internal rotation but I can't it just everything just pulls down especially when it gets heavy so like it's it's a weird feeling that I've tried to explain <coughs> to other people is that I'm trying to reach up but as soon as the weight gets there everything just wants to just pull down and then that's where the break the elbow goes um, so for me it was taking away well doing less pull-ups uh, doing a lot less sort of um, like stuff that's going to aggravate my like serratus and biceps well that makes sense if you if you think of a like really jacked bodybuilder they're, they're probably not going to be able to lock out right like yeah well arms yeah exactly so I used to you know I used to train in my garage all I did was like power because Yannick is so massive um, you know I did like rows and stuff and uh, like lots of pull-ups and all that stuff so like I know where it stems from I barely use the press ever so that's like that my tricep uh, strength was woeful mm-hmm. um, and it still is um, well your point was kind of going to be my point without saying the tricep piece I was going to say triceps um, mm. as an accessory um, if you don't do it then you should do it um, yeah. if your lockout is um, lacking or your jerk is lacking um, tricep work and, and when you're saying that you're talking about like things like tricep extensions skull crushes tricep extensions skull overhead. crushes even dips um, like with the elbows in not f- flared out like I think dips is good um, I had to learn to do dips properly yeah because that's a big thing too then Doing it then become properly. a lot more again for me my la- like my serratus they go away yeah yeah, so that was a, a big accessory piece that helps with my jerk. Yeah. Phil? Um, I would go with... I agree with everything you guys said. I actually don't think the the, the triceps help that much. I mean, look, uh, I mean, in the sense of a lot... In, in the muscular sense, it definitely does. But working on strengthening the triceps may or may not improve your work lockout, is my point. Because mm-hmm. I believe <coughs> that the lockout strength comes from your ability to upwardly rotate the scapula. It comes yeah. from your ability to go from here to there, right? So the, the cue, the cue that we we are given a lot is punch, punch, punch. Has anyone been taught how to throw a proper punch ever? I have. Yeah. yeah. I mean and what what do you do? Does the punch you go straight or do you, you rotate. rotate? You rotate, right? So when you teach someone how to jerk, if you're having trouble with the lockout, don't think about pushing it up. Think about like a spin, like you're drilling, you're drilling your arm up, and you're drilling yourself under the bar, and that. For me, when I first got taught that in China, using the traps to upwardly rotate and like drill yourself under, that just made my like lockout so quick. And I've never, I've never struggled with um, if 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 it's, if it's there, it's there. I've never struggled with the bar coming down. Um, but what I do struggle with is my shoulder will give out sometimes. It's pretty shit. But in terms of the actual movement, think of it as a drill. Drill your arms under the bar after you drive it. Mm. And um, just to add to that, and this is getting a little too in depth, probably, but uh, when you're, if you are gonna think about drilling and you're getting those traps involved, it's actually a much safer position for your shoulder mm. because if you don't do that and then your humerus, you know, comes forward, you can get a lot of impingement issues very easily. You very rarely will you get impingement issues if your shoulders sort of like uh, your humerus is sitting further back. Mm. Um, so that that's something that like for the guys at home, coaches at home look at just to see where the shoulder is sitting as well overhead. You mm-hmm. know, if, if that shoulder capsule is traveling forward, then they're probably not shrugging up well, right? Or yeah. they're not rotating well. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess another thing that people look at if they are trying to train it, 
is start looking at where they press just to work on that because uh, the amount of people that you see that are beginners to lifting weights or they were at a commercial gym and they strict press in front of them mm -hmm. they don't know how to bring the bar back towards that sort of solid lockout position um, setting the scapula properly and, and shrugging up hmm. and, and it's hard I mean your head is in the way and mm -hmm. for some of us our heads are bigger than a lot of you know, <laughs> half their bodies so that's why you shaved your beard <laughs> <laughs> missed all your jokes your last time <laughs> You know, so you know that bar is starting in front of you, mm. and it has to kind of travel backwards, right, slightly. So yeah, well, I'm, I'm really big on like bar path sort of joking, like getting that as tight as possible. Like, how, how can we make that line the shortest possible way? Mm. Um, wherever that the, the intention of pushing back, if their head is set, um, so that we can clear it with a, a shorter space. Um, and to be honest, a lot of people I think their bar path for the jerk is not as tight as it could be. Mm. And when you're trying to lift the, like the heaviest weight um, possible over your head, you need every like bit of efficiency, I think, um, to go from there to, to overhead. Cool. Um, cool. Boo, I want you to finish just quickly with uh, just some quick fundamental things people can look for for their jerks. Just list them out. Fundamental things? Yeah, just like, you know, where, where the front foot should be, where the back foot should be how bent they should be, just roughly. Um, yeah, we already talked about a lot of yeah. this. So I just want to give them a, a lot, a, a lot of it, I think, of um, I, I like to see good positions, just like Phil was talking about. So from shoulder to, to overhead, and then from there downwards as well, or just all of that, um, and how that stacks, and if they can or can't get into that good position. And how should it stack? Just basically the, the heaviest part of the the body, which is the bar at, at this point, needs to be completely uh, in between your center of mass, right? Ideally, yes, yeah. And or obviously any well. like deviation, like in the body, whether it's like your rib cage flaring, your, your, your lumbar um, extending, um, stuff like that, or your hip being um, not quite underneath, that will make it super, super hard um, to get the most out of your jerk. So I just told Phil to kind of taste it. No, that's cool because what I'm getting from all of you guys is that uh, it's not actually the footwork that's the most important. It's kind of like what happens up from there. I mean, I know the legs are the base and they're really important, but you know, how often? Like, do you if you kind of split your leg, if your body is stacked, you'll catch it. Because like I jumped like to my right on my my final jerk, right? But like my body was stacked enough where I could support it, um, even though my footwork for that specific lift wasn't the best. Like it wasn't ideal. I'd moved, I shifted to the right with my feet, but like my body was stacked directly underneath it. Cool. I think that's a pretty good place to leave off with that subject. Um, do you guys still want to talk about what happened yesterday? No. Uh, I don't no. no. We're good? Okay. I'm I good. Want to drink. Okay, cool. Hey, um, let's let's uh sound off in a row of like what you guys got going on and stuff, so uh, maybe Yannick, you can hit us off. Um, Where can people find you? What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. So find us uh, underscore Shred Fitness underscore on Instagram. Uh, Shred Fitness on Facebook. Um, we are at three slash seventy six Sunny Hole Road, Blacktown. If you want to come in and check us out. Two one four eight. Two one four eight. Westside. Um, you know, uh, come check us out. We. we and see what we have, what we have happening over at Shred Fitness. Um, yeah. So you're a weightlifting gym, but you're also a fitness gym. So a fitness gym. I, I, you know, I think we are really starting to um, excel in sort of like quite a few range of strength sports. So um, if you want to get strong, and, and you know, also if there's someone else that wants to get fit or just look better, come check us out. Yeah. How good are your body transformations lately, man? Yeah, solid. You've been man. posting a whole bunch of them. Yeah. It's really cool to see that you're changing people's lives and not just uh, like Olympic weightlifters. Yeah, definitely, and um, and some of them through Olympic weightlifting. Yeah, some you know some of our best transformations were th like <coughs> through weightlifters, man. So it's just about you know just improving their nutrition and um, you know for the most part their performance shot up too. Like like I said, you know times have changed and the, the fat weight fat weightlifter isn't necessarily um, the only weightlifter anymore. So um, you can get fit and healthy through a range of different sports. You know that's just how you do it. Phil. Where can people find you? Find me on Instagram, philip.pt. I work out of Adonis Athletics in Granville. 
but you'll have to contact me first because I'm only there by appointment. I coach weightlifters. If you want to learn from me, that's fine as well. But my main, well, what I like to see as my main role is, um, I like to work with people who have kind of, kind of, they, they, they want to change, change their behavior. They want to change, improve their, their health and everything that it comes with that. But you, you failed a few times. So I want to work with you people because, um, for me anyway, health is a very complex top topic, and it's it stems from my background in physiotherapy, personal training. I'm sure I'm sure you see this as well, Yannick. You have people who come in and they want to get healthy, but the physical side is just like the the, the manifestation of something wrong within their social and their their psychological health. Yeah, hundred percent. That's probably one of the biggest things that I deal with. Um, is that you know if you if you can't you can't get the results that people want by just changing one thing. Exactly. There yeah. is a range of different things that we need to fix, yeah. and outlook is usually the first one. Yeah. So you know, um, we were talking about transformation in six week challenge. Mm. Man, I was looking at people that want to change their lifestyle, not just get fit. I literally spoke to people that said, "I want to lose this much in six weeks." I said, "It's not for you." If you don't have the idea of wanting to train after that, I don't want you to lose weight. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, I'm very much. I'd like to. I like to work with those people, um, and and one one thing that I'm really passionate about is kids. People, kids who are roughly from 15 to 17, you're hitting that growth spurt age. Um, and in this day and age, we have Instagram, obviously, and it's a good, it's a tool, but it's being used by, it's being used by these kids, and they're constantly comparing themselves to these fitness models and other other you know uh, health. Mm. Health gurus, and 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 it's, there's no surprise. There's a lot of depression and there's a lot of body image issues that are on the rise because of this. So, my my goal with the the youth program that I run is, and I do it for free, for any kid that wants to do it with me, you're welcome to come as long as it doesn't take away from any of the other people I, I service. I want you. I want to teach you how to lift properly, safely, and give you any guidance you want within your health and fitness because. When I was your age, when I was 15, 16, like I, w I came from a rough, not a poor family, but we didn't have that much money and we didn't have this luxury of having a trainer give you the right advice. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we all must have wasted time within our own training. 100%. Oh, yeah. right? if, I had, if I had mm -hmm. you when I was uh, you know, 15 or 17, yeah. I would be a completely different person. Exactly. Like, and that's what I want to get into. But I think this, we're in a new age where coaches like us were not even a thing back then. There was personal trainers who just want to get people jacked like bodybuilders. Yeah. yeah. And they, I think there's uh, that old school, I wouldn't say old school, there's a man, there was a, a generation of people training that actually ruined a lot of people. Yeah. Well, the, my, my angle is if you're a kid and you look female or male, whatever, whatever, female, male or whatever, I mean that, like, you know, the gender is just fluid, apparently. Um, anyway, <coughs> uh, if you want to get big, for the um, for narcissistic reasons on Instagram, you want to do that. That's fine. Uh, well, maybe not fine, but if you want to do it, it's best probably that you learn from someone who is not trying to exploit you. I'm not asking for your money. I'm actually there to just help you. If you're gonna do it, do it properly. If you want to get big, I'll give you the right advice. And if you want to flaunt it all over Instagram, power power to you. But I don't want some guy coming along to you, give, giving you false promises, giving you. Uh, steroids or anything and telling you that this is the only way like I want to be there for these kids before like the toxic world of world and fit, uh, of health and fitness gets into these people cool Andrew um, you can find me on Instagram snatch underscore sensei uh, everything is on there so most of my links and stuff that you can find from me is on there but um, I don't really need to um, I guess plug in services with me I want you guys just to go check uh, what I do on there because um, and follow me for that because I'm just putting a lot of good shit out on there and, and that's that's the main thing for me yeah awesome. some good some shit. awesome information for people about weightlifting about life actually Phil is another person to follow if you want uh, a lot of just you know information like something daily to just wake up and be like hey look you know this is something I need to think about each day so both of you are doing an awesome job with that as well. Uh, guys, you can find Raw Barbell Club at Raw Barbell Club on all of our social medias. So that's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, either where you're watching this. And obviously we've got the podcast. 
if you really liked this episode, I loved it. It's freaking so much fun to talk to you guys. Um, make sure you message us, uh, in either individually or just to to Raw Barbell Club, and we'll make sure we do this uh, again. Uh, hopefully, we can make this a somewhat regular thing. That'd be really cool. Mm. Yeah, and thanks for fun. having us, Andy. Make sure you guys share it. And lastly, if you want to support the podcast, you know what to do. Just go into the description and click the donate button. Guys, I will see you next time. And thank you so much for joining us. See ya. Ciao. Ciao. Done. How'd you guys find that? Cool. That was cool. Cool. I mean, you guys picked on me. It wasn't nice. <laughs> I, I kept that minimal. It was Phil. <laughs> Phil was here. <laughs> Why are we here? We're not going to pick on each other. Oh, have you got any food, Andy? Uh, <laughs> I've got... <laughs> what an Asian. Do you eat... Uh, He's late. Can you drink... He's um, food. Like, up and goes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's up and goes in the food. There's, like, noodle probably. cups, too. Oh, yeah, there's noodle cups. Oh, shit. Yes. Yeah, yeah, take one of those. Shit, yes. <laughs> Asian bro. I haven't eaten more. Hold on, like let's take a photo. Oh yeah, we should take a photo.